want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is the uh, fifth of five briefings that the Marijuana Justice Coalition is putting on for Senate staff on comprehensive marijuana reform. Uh, the Marijuana Justice Coalition was convened in, uh, I believe, 2018 uh, and uh, has about 20 uh, organizations in it, all working on various aspects of marijuana reform from uh, civil rights, criminal justice reform aspects, to immigration, uh, minority participation in the industry, medical cannabis, uh, or the therapeutic use of cannabis, rather. Um, uh, you know, uh, we have religious organizations, we have you know, veterans, we, we've got a wide, wide range of um, organizations in the, the Marijuana Justice Coalition. We're providing perspectives on uh, mar comprehensive marijuana reform that may not have necessarily been uh, part of the conversation up until now. And like I said, this is the fifth of our five in our Senate briefing series. Um, and this one is on uh, patients and veterans. Um, so when, Mar when Congress first was considering marijuana reform, uh, maybe five or 10 years ago, veterans and patients were really at the forefront of the conversation and have somewhat taken um, a back seat to some of the you know, commercial elements, some of the criminal justice reform elements, all important aspects. But we wanna turn the conversation back to uh, veterans and patients uh, because it's, they're, they're still uh, a very important um, population in this movement, and uh, uh, we hope that there's uh, that federal policy will address uh, their particular needs. Approximately two thirds of the states at this point have now adopted uh, laws that allow patients uh, to have some access to uh, marijuana for therapeutic purposes uh, with a physician's recommendation. These programs have provided relief for millions of Americans and have saved the federal government. Uh, hundreds of millions, possibly billions at this point in Medicare Part D expenditures. Yet medical marijuana patients have no access to insurance coverage uh, and pay 100% out of pocket. Uh, veterans are particularly harmed uh, by federal prohibition because the Veterans Administration uh, is very reluctant to uh, help facilitate medical marijuana therapy for its patients. Uh, and so we would like to turn the conversation uh, to some experts in these areas. Uh, joining us today, we have Roz McCarthy, who is the founder and CEO of Minorities for Medical Marijuana. We have Dr. Rachel Knox, MD and MBA, uh, board uh, member of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. And Eric Opel, uh, veteran and founder uh, and CEO of the Veterans uh, Cannabis Coalition. Uh, but before we dive in, uh, we're going to have um, a, a Senate staffer uh, give an introduction. Um, I want to turn it over uh, to uh, Colby Carpenter from Senator Merkley's office. Senator Merkley has really been uh, one of the, uh, the longest and most dedicated champions to marijuana reform in the Senate. When this issue was getting very little attention, Senator Merkley was one of the few uh, senators who was, who was speaking up for uh, the rights of medical marijuana patients. Uh, and speaking to this issue in general. So we're really uh, thrilled to have someone from uh, Senator Merkley's staff with us today. And I'll turn it over now to, uh, to Colby. Thank you so much, Mike. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Marijuana Justice Coalition Senate briefing on veterans and patients. My name is Colby Carpenter and I'm a legislative correspondent for Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon working on cannabis related policy. So on behalf of Senator Merkley and his office, I'm really honored to kick off today's discussion on such an important topic. As we all know, our nation's veterans are owed a tremendous amount of gratitude for their service, and they deserve the best quality health options in the world through the VA system. Currently, our veterans and their VA providers are not able to discuss the full range of legal options, health options in their home states, including access to medical marijuana programs. And as Mike mentioned earlier, more than half states, along with the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, have legal medical cannabis programs. And veterans in every single state, especially those states, you know, deserve the full menu of available medical care. So for years, Senator Merkley has advocated for updating these outdated laws that censor veterans' doctor-patients relationships. 
using his position on the Senate Appropriations Committee, he has fought year after year for an amendment to the Military Construction, Veterans Affairs, and Related Agencies Appropriations Act that would protect veterans' ability to discuss with VA physicians the use of medical marijuana in states where it's legal. This year's appropriation cycle is certainly no different. Uh, while we have seen progress, including the amendment being adopted in committee by voice vote last year, uh, Senator Merkley is working hard to ensure that the amendment is kept in the final version of the appropriations bill for fiscal year 2023. He was also uh, very proud to co-sponsor the Veter Veterans Medical Marijuana Safe Harbor Act, led by his colleague and fellow cannabis policy champion, Senator Schatz that would allow doctors at the VA to prescribe medical marijuana to veterans and states with established programs. Additionally, Senator Merkley's office hosts monthly virtual meetings that bring together Senate offices and cannabis advocates to discuss new developments and opportunities to move the ball forward on federal cannabis policy, including related to today's briefing topic. So please feel welcome to reach out to me if your office or organization is interested in attending those meetings, we'd love to have you. In closing, we want to thank all the advocates like the Marijuana Justice Coalition and its members who relentlessly advocate for sensible federal cannabis legislation. We are grateful to be your partners in this effort, and we look forward to a fruitful conversation from the fabulous panel. Thanks all. I think you're muted, Mike. So sorry to say that. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, um, what I was just saying was uh, for all the staffers uh, here today who um, who aren't already on the uh, the distribution list for uh, for Senator Merkley's uh, work group, uh, please get in touch with Colby. It's a great way to to stay in touch with uh, what's with keep up to date with what's going on uh, legislatively uh, on both sides of uh, Congress and uh, to stay up to date on uh, really all the happenings and, and be a part of uh, what's rapidly becoming a um, uh, more prominent issue in the Senate. Uh, really appreciate it, uh, Colby. Um, just want to remind uh, folks, we are recording this session, um, but we will turn off the recording uh, around uh, 1.30 uh, to turn it over to audience Q&A. So feel free to be candid uh, during the audience uh, Q&A. Uh, we won't be recording uh, that component, but we are recording uh, this initial segment and it will go up on uh, YouTube later. Uh, so uh, we're going to kick it over now to our panelists. We got some really great experts uh, here today. Our first question uh, will go to uh, Dr. Knox. Um, you know, Dr. Knox, I mentioned earlier, uh, millions of Americans have benefited from the, the therapeutic use of, of uh, marijuana and uh, it's, it's generated hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in savings for the, uh, the American public at this point. Um, just to do some level setting at the beginning to talk about uh, you know, the benefits of medical uh, marijuana therapy, could you talk about uh, some of the other aspects of how the public at large could benefit from uh, federal legalization uh, allowing medical cannabis therapy? Certainly, Mike. So DFCR maintains that the single most impactful way cannabis will benefit the health of all Americans is through legalization, right? Simply put, ongoing criminalization and its consequences directly impact every determinant of health, uh, determinants that are negatively compounded by social designations of race and ethnicity, we know, also social circumstances like poverty and prior conviction. So the role that prohibition continues to play in sustaining medical disparities is a direct one. And, that can no longer go unrecognized, right? That being said, yes, <laughs> uh, 2013 data did tell us that legalization contributed to millions uh, of dollars in Medicare Part D expenditures. Uh, and we know this number is an underestimate compared to what savings could be if more than a handful of physicians like me right, <laughs> recommended cannabis. Um, it's also been forecast that federal legalization could result in $1 billion in Medicaid savings across all 50 states. So I think the, the salient you know, question is, why have we seen cost savings? That's because cannabis is effective for our consumers. Um, and, and today, 2022, both in vitro and in vivo trials are increasingly supporting what we once called you know, anecdotal reports that cannabis improves pain, sleep, and anxiety and, and more difficult to treat conditions like inflammation, 
but diseases of inflammation, diseases of aging, like cancer. We know a lot of molecules in cannabis have anti-malignancy properties, uh, dementia by way of its anti-neurodegenerative you know, properties. And, and these are among the leading causes of death and disability in our country. Right? So we are seeing cost savings because consumers are choosing and sticking with cannabis over their pharmaceutical alternatives. And they're doing so because they are absolutely indeed experiencing broad benefits. We cannot achieve those monumental cost savings if they aren't. Uh, I consider the cat out of the bag. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Dr. Knox. Um, definitely compelling. Uh, Eric, I wanna turn it over to, to you uh, now. Um, we know in the past that the, the Veterans Administration has uh, been somewhat reluctant to uh, allowing uh, veterans access to medical cannabis therapy. Could you talk about some of the current state of those roadblocks and if congressional action is necessary to improve those conditions? Yes, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, and I guess I can segue off of Colby uh, mentioning the Veterans Equal Access Amendment, um, which is the uh, a, a bill that has that goes to I think one of the biggest roadblocks, which is the inability for VA doctors who are federal employees to engage in any kind of way with state legal medical cannabis programs or adult use programs. In either case, a VA doctor is unable to uh, be the medical um, recommender. You know, there is no state where anyone is prescribed cannabis, right? There is no uh, state or federal, um, you know, recognized point of access where a doctor can refer someone and they can get, you know, it's not FDA approved, we understand that. So what, how most state medical recommend, medical programs function is they, they require a doctor to certify that you uh, require cannabis uh, to treat your uh, specific medical needs. Places like California where I live, very, very straightforward and low barrier uh, to getting a medical recommendation. You know, $40, you know, a few minutes on the phone largely because the list of qualifying conditions is so broad. Uh, but in other states like Pennsylvania, it could be a few hundred dollars uh, to get a doctor's recommendation. And for veterans who are often low income or on fixed incomes, uh, you know, that, that additional cost is prohibitive. Um, and it also, I, I would say, creates a, uh, you know, an artificial barrier that undermines you know, most states' desire to uh, diminish the unregulated market, right? The more barriers to entry that you put between legal access and not, you know, the, the less likely, you know, someone who who ha, you know, who's going to have difficulty navigating those barriers uh, is going to hit, um, going to be able to access them. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to turn now to uh, Roz. Um, Minorities for Medical Marijuana has uh, a large number of veterans in its membership. Uh, could you uh, tell us what are some of the priorities of uh, your veteran uh, members, uh, what they're seeking now in federal reform? All right, now I'm ready. <laughs> Sorry about that. So first and foremost, thank you, uh, DPA, for having me to have this really important and impactful conversation. And um, I cannot reiterate the importance of the last point in regards to safe access for our veterans, their opportunity to be able to go to their physician or go into the VA um, healthcare system that has been created for their support and for their wellness and not be able to have access information education about um, cannabis as an option for their care. Um, it's a travesty, to be honest with you. And so one of the priorities with m mm we actually have a, a program that's focused on veteran outreach education um, that we just recently came into an agreement and was is, and is funded by Canopy. And, um, and, and Canopy saw the vision of what we want to do because not only do we have veterans, but I will, I will tell you this, veterans from minority communities, black and brown veterans, are even more likely to fall out of and not have access to resources and not have education. So recently we have been hosting free medical marijuana card clinics. Um, our corporate office is located in Orlando, Florida. Florida is a medical state, which is one of those states where you pay $250, $300 for that first physician engagement. And it can be very costly, 
but also people are just kind of skittish and not sure. And I will tell you the one, number one thing that our veterans who come to our free medical marijuana clinic, their issue and their concern, um, not only in being able to have access, but what about my right to carry my, you know, my, my gun permit? How does that affect that? They, they have so many questions that they need to get answered. And so we have been hosting these free medical marijuana card clinics. Our medical director is Dr. Joseph Rosado. He's one of the first recommending physicians in the state of Florida. And literally we have taken on the expense of, high, of having him in that capacity of being able to serve these patients. And we've served over the last three months, 65 patients have gotten their medical marijuana card. And out of that, I would say a good 12% have been veterans that have been able to come to the clinic, get information, get educated, but also sit with that physician and then be able to have their card. And their number one reply and comment afterwards is, I'm so glad I have this. I'm so glad I feel safe and I feel legal and I got it from people that I trust. So um, that's just one of the programs, but it's really something that's near and dear to my heart. Thanks, Roz. And I'll just point out that um, bills like the uh, the Moore Act, which passed in Congress uh, back at the end of uh, March or beginning of April, rather, or um, the uh, the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act that's being uh, contemplated right now by uh, Senators uh, Schumer, uh, Booker, and Wyden. We, we expect introduction in the, the coming weeks. Would create some uh, funding mechanisms that would help organizations like M for MM be able to put on these patient clinics and facilitate medical cannabis access that way. Uh, we'll turn the conversation uh, back to, uh, to Dr. Knox and uh, the, the, the issue of, uh, of federal regulation of uh, the therapeutic use of marijuana. Um, we know that the FDA has a process for approving botanical medicines, but it's not really worked. It's only uh, approved maybe two or three substances. They've been single compound substances. Marijuana has dozens of compounds, so it doesn't really fit, you know, like trying to fit a uh, square peg in a round hole type situation. Um, so could you, do you think that there is a viable uh, regulatory structure for the therapeutic use of cannabis? And uh, could you um, outline it if, if you think one is there? Yeah, I do. Um, but first, I think a clean distinction has to be made between the medical use of retail cannabis, right, the discretionary right to use market grade cannabis for medical purposes, and then our pharmaceutical cannabinoid drugs, FDA approved and regulated pharmaceutical grade drugs derived from cannabis like Epidiolex and Sativex, which I hear might be coming uh, to the United States in 2023. So understanding the difference cannot be stressed enough at this time, especially when the FDA and DEA recognize that quote unquote medical or medicinal cannabis um, means pharmaceutical drugs, right? Means pharmaceutical cannabis. So once this distinction is understood, the conversation about regulating medical cannabis becomes pretty simple in my mind, right? There are already clear uh, well-established paths forward for FDA to regulate single molecule pharmaceutical grade cannabis derived drugs and botanical medicines, like you say, uh, for clinical prescription. Um, and there doesn't need to be a departure from that status quo, right? They don't need to reinvent that wheel. Uh, I also think it's reasonable, if not expected, for the FDA to weigh in on labeling and advertising. Um, other quality control standards for market grade cannabis products, including whole plant products. Uh, but I recommend that this be the limitation of the FDA's role in regulating retail cannabis. The FDA's approval process is just not a viable mechanism for approving the large amount of chemovars, right, or chemical varieties of cannabis that are in existence. So in light of this, um, I do believe states should be encouraged to maintain and use cannabis tax revenue to fund medical or therapeutic use programs. Um, consumers are going to continue to access cannabis through to dispensaries to purchase what they consider medicine, adult dispensaries. We know the top three reasons adults patronize uh, dispensaries for so-called recreational uh, purposes are to address pain, insomnia, and anxiety. They're going to continue to do that, especially when these pharmaceutical grade products like Epidiolex cost $30,000 a year. Um, and not only that, they, they're, they're FDA approved to treat very specific, very few uh, conditions. So why wouldn't patients continue to buy from their local dispensaries right, for a fraction of that price? So by way of regulation, I, I think what's most needed by patients at the state level, um, their providers, 
the public at large is support. Um, I think we need to invest in medical use programs and these programs should do a few things. They should comprehensively support um, consumers choosing to use cannabis and cannabis products for medical reasons through holistic education, peer support services, clinical support services, skilled medical oversight, maybe Medicaid covering the cost of visits and product, um, inform and align cannabis policy, the commercial industry and, and clinical management with real time evidence emerging from cannabis science and clinical research, because we need to ensure that consumers have you know, access to not just affordable and safe cannabis, but meaningful products um, that make sense for their outcomes that they're trying to achieve. And then lastly, um, support state public health agencies. Um, a medical use cannabis pr pr program is a harm reduction tool. Thank you, Dr. Knox. That actually doesn't sound nearly as complicated as some people might might be perceiving that this this uh, type of regulatory approach needs to be. So uh, thank you for putting that that out there. Uh, Roz, can I turn back to you now? Um, we know most of the attention around uh, marijuana policy reform and uh, social equity has been, you know, focused, you know, either around you know, business opportunities or criminal justice reform issues. But we also uh, know that the black and brown Americans are less likely than white Americans to be registered as uh, patients in state programs. Um, could you speak to some of the issues as to why people of color appear to have less access uh, to the therapeutic use of marijuana under these programs and uh, perhaps how ending federal uh, criminalization might help in this situation? So <clears throat> I, let me tell you something, and I'm just going to be honest with you. The federal criminalization and, um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the, the, the thought that we need to decriminalize is, is, of course, a number one priority. But in these black and brown communities, health equity and lack of access to health care has been an issue way before cannabis legalization happened. We've always had an issue of being able to have access to a physician, access to affordable medicine and resources. The whole reason why I started m for mm was for me, I couldn't square up how we're going to have we're going to legalize this plant that has um, that, that we've seen has systematically destroyed community. But now we're going to tell the same communities that you can now have access to this as an option for, for medicine. If you don't put something in place where people can, from that, that community that's been hurt, that has been um, that has been targeted. If you don't put people, if you don't put entities, if you don't put organizations in their community that they can trust, you won't, you will always see barriers to entry. And that's what m for mm has created trust in our community. And so, I mean, it's not easy. It, it's, it's a pull even for us sometimes, um, but it's, we were able to have a successful access to people getting their card because they see us in their community. They, one, there is something about having kinship with people that look like you, but also they trust the information. And once they start trusting the information, I'll tell you, to be honest with you, our first clinic that we had um, in April, it was mm, mediocre. But then when they when folks came in and they were, they felt supported and not, you know, not talked down to, my number one thing is that you will always get excellent customer service and you will be treated with respect. I told them if you go to a dispensary and if you're not treated with respect, you call me and I will call the dispensary and I will let them have it. And so it was all these different pieces of the puzzle that came together. Whereas, so the next clinic and the next clinic, we had people coming in, we couldn't even handle because they were calling their friends. They were saying, hey, listen, mom, you need to come down here, bring your medical records. And that's where we have to build community around policy. If we create policy and don't think about how it trickles down to community, you know, shame on us. Thank you, Roz. That's really interesting how the uh, the the demonization of marijuana has undermined uh, the, the the faith of, of communities of color in in the therapeutic use of marijuana. And that I think that's one of the um, sort of the the underreported problems of uh, our decades long uh, battle with uh, marijuana prohibition. Uh, thank you for that, um, Eric. Going to turn back to you now. Um, and, uh, just wanted to, you know, the discussion around, um, veterans access to, to medical cannabis therapy, it's almost always, uh, associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. And we do know that there's a lot of potential for treating PTSD, uh, with medical cannabis or with cannabis. 
Um, but that's not the only uh, medical condition that afflicts veterans uh, for which uh, marijuana could be good for. Could you talk about some of those other conditions? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, right, I think to your point, PTSD often gets brought up, uh, you know, and, and sometimes um, uniquely uh, related to veterans, which is not the case, right? PTSD is an incredibly common condition. It can, it, you know, anyone who experiences anything that puts their life at risk, another's life at risk, sees, you know, death or destruction, uh, you know, in some kind of uh, some, some circumstances, all of those, you know, scenarios, which happen, you know, uh, in, in, you know, two people all over the world um, can trigger PT, you know, can uh, contribute to PTSD, excuse me. But, you know, I think what a lot, I think the, the focus on PTSD loses track of a, a lot of the bigger issues that veterans are dealing with and something that's relevant right now in, in the Senate, which is, you know, toxic exposure, I would say would be one of the other primary issues of how veterans or, you know, how active duty service members, you know, have, uh, have been treated during their service, what they've been um, exposed to in this case, and the long-term effects of that exposure. Uh, my stepfather was a Vietnam veteran, suffered from Agent Orange exposure, you know, throughout, throughout his life after he, uh, you know, served in combat in the Marine Corps. Uh, you know, I myself, I, you know, I slept downwind of burn pits for, you know, a cumulative about three years across all my deployments in my seven years in the Army. Uh, you know, I know, I know veterans, uh, post 9-11 veterans of my own age who have you know, developed rare forms of cancer uh, that they that they associate with their exposure to burn pits. You know, so and and to say like, oh, you know, cannabis is PTSD. You know, what are we talking about when we're talking about toxic exposure? You know, we're, we're talking about neurological diseases. You know, we're talking about cancer. We're talking about things that are not particularly well treated by our current armamentarium of drugs uh, that doctors have access to. And you know, chemo and radiation, you know, are are great evidence-based therapies, but you know, they are not obviously they don't work 100% of the time. And the issues, you know, and, and cannabis, and specifically THC in the form of Marinol uh, or Dronabinol in the generic, was in 1998 became the first cannabinoid drug uh, that the DEA approved or that the DEA uh, scheduled as a Schedule II drug, or it was eventually uh, downgraded to Schedule III. So you know, one of the earliest um, acknowledgments by the federal government of the of the medical utility of cannabis, in this case THC, uh, was its approved use for chemo um, chemo induced nausea. And, you know, and and that that sort of background. And of course, we can look at CBD as well. Um, you know, but you know, THC and CBD. Yeah, I'll, I'll just wrap that. Is you know, they 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 have a utility far beyond just PTSD. Um, Thank you, Dr. Knox. I think, I think maybe the downgrade was in 1998 then uh, to Schedule 3. Uh, yeah, so the utility of this plan, you know, goes far beyond PTSD. And I, and I think that veteran experience uh, speaks to that, you know, um, extensively in, in terms of how veterans have experienced cannabis and the, you know, the benefits that they've uh, related that they've, uh, they've gotten from it. Thank you for that, Eric. And yeah, also uh, just wanted to underscore that point you made at the beginning that you know PTSD is not a uniquely uh, veter uh, an affliction that uniquely afflicts veterans. Uh, PTSD, uh, you know, tr survivors of violent crime, sexual assault, uh, high incidences of PTSD. Law enforcement and other first responders have high incidence of PTSD. So when we're talking about uh, restricting. Uh, medical marijuana access to uh, certain populations, safety sensitive jobs, you know, law enforcement, firefighters, uh, EMS personnel likely have PTSD and we're denying them access to a therapeutic substance that could help with them. So we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about restrictions for certain types of jobs. Just a side note there. Before we turn to audience uh, q and I got one more question. Uh, I'll turn this to the whole group um, uh, for anyone who wants to jump in. But one of the reasons, if you've been working on this issue uh, uh, federally or, or even at the state level, um, that you often hear about like why we can't move on marijuana reform is that it just hasn't been researched enough. Um, can, uh, do, can any of you all speak to uh, whether there's uh, you know, enough research out there for us to make an informed policy decision on the legalization of marijuana? 
Happy to. <laughs> we absolutely know enough about cannabis, cannabis to legalize uh, far more, in fact, than we know about many FDA approved drugs that we frequently prescribe to patients or, or that patients can purchase over the counter. Right? Cannabis research has been conducted domestically and abroad since the 1960s. Um, and not only has NIDA funded studies on the health effects of cannabis for decades, but in 2017, we had the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and, and Medicine publish their second cannabis study. It was a comprehensive meta-analysis on cannabis research and reported several conditions backed by high levels, relatively high levels of evidence that cannabis may be effective medicine in the treatment of, uh, yes, nausea and vomiting. We knew that by way of the FDA approval of Marinol. Um, uh, you know, uh, pain, spasticity related disorders like multiple sclerosis. I mentioned Sativex. Sativex is a one to one approved in the EU, um, probably going to be approved here in the United States very soon. Um, but, um, you know, notable too, bringing up Dronabinol and Marinol again, right? These are, mal these are, these are, we lose her. Oh no. Oh no, she was dropping yeah. such good gems, man. Oh, man. No basis. Uh, and, and quite frankly, there has never been right a basis for its schedule one designation or arguably on the controlled substances list, right? This is not a chicken or the egg matter anymore. Um, it's not a catch-22. This is a matter of political will. Uh, and what we know for certain is that if cannabis is rescheduled or even descheduled, we will be able to conduct advanced research on humans, right? On us to begin answering some of our most pressing questions uh, with respect to safety and medicinal potential, right? The US is the global leader in biomedical research. So it's really quite odd and rather devastating um, that we're unable to study cannabis further, uh, you know, come 2022. And the last thing I'll say on this is that we know cannabis is safe enough to allow adults to make calculated risks uh, decisions, right? We do that with alcohol. Um, we, we afford them this freedom with respect to a host of known toxic substances every single day. So we, we know enough about cannabis to remove it from the CSA, legalize it, regulate it. And by doing so, we stand to know so much more. Thank you, Dr. Knox. Um, we haven't received any questions yet, but that's no problem. We have a couple uh, uh, other uh, talking points we can bring up here uh, now. Um, so um, what to, I, I remember earlier in the conversation, Dr. Knox mentioned uh, cannabis could potentially used as a harm reduction tool. Uh, we do know that, um, you know, specifically with veterans populations, uh, uses of alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceuticals, and even unregulated uh, controlled substances uh, tend to be disproportionately above the, that of the, the general population. Um, uh, could anyone speak to how uh, cannabis could be used as a, a harm reduction tool? I'll jump in. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I think that's, you know, in my uh, advocacy work, that, that's probably how I look at cannabis um, primarily. Uh, I, I do a lot of on the ground work with patients in California. We, in California, there's a law that allows the licensed industry to donate uh, products to patients at no cost. And to be, a, to be a patient in California, all you have to have is a doctor's recommendation, which uh, is relatively straightforward to, uh, to get and pretty low cost in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and in, in turn, in, in doing this, right, and, and working with a lot of folks who Hey, I'm are, sorry, guys. I was on another, actually, it was. Uh, and in doing, and doing that, the, the work with, you know, and helping provide donations and education to a lot of veterans, you know, you get to see how people are using cannabis in their day-to-day -day life, right? And it's not just as simple as, oh, you know, you have a veteran a joint and you're going to cure their PTSD. It, it, it's a it's much more of a uh, path, I would say, uh, in helping people in this in this case, veterans start to figure out like what they can use cannabis for that they could potentially, you know, and often and I wouldn't say this is necessarily ha the best uh, best case scenario uh, in in patients kind of um, 
leading their own uh, tapering, right? But that's, you know, you know and, and however you might feel about that, like that's where they, that's where so many of these folks are, right? They have been, you know, but the VA led the way in opioid prescribing, you know, and now they've led the way in opioid deprescribing. And what they are giving people for pain is no longer effective opioids, which whatever you think about opioids, they actually work, right? Now there's risks involved with it that we that we need to be aware of, but they're you know they shouldn't be demonized any more than any other substance, right? There's no intent behind you know a molecule. Uh, it has effects that we like and stuff that we don't like. So you know with opioids, you know the VA the crackdown on opioids basically has now resulted in this net patient abandonment of veterans who were uh, on long-term opioid treatment that are now scrambling to manage their pain, and we're seeing. You know, we're not seeing any reduction in veteran suicide, even though the, the VA has, has drastically cut the number of opioids they're prescribing. In fact, we're seeing, you know, elevated levels of suicide despite all the interventions over the last 20 years. 120,000 veterans have died by suicide in, you know, since 9-11, and a, and a quarter of those have been post-9-11 veterans. Uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, and the track, the, that track record, I think, is indicative of what we're doing isn't working. And I'm not saying that you know what I'm doing is is necessarily the you know the 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 right way or but like this is you know I'm hearing from patients directly like this is what they're going through and this is what they're having to you know and and they're having to figure out these the answers to these questions largely on their own you know and and you know and is that where we want veterans and, and patients I'm not sure so I'll yeah, I'll just leave it there. Uh, great points, Eric. Yeah, I think you know, that's one of the underreported elements of. Uh, federal criminalization uh, is that those it, people with medical conditions that marijuana can help uh, treat, they're left in the shadows. They're, they're, they have to, you know, use suboptimal means to learn about medical marijuana, about the medical benefits of marijuana. They have to, to talk to, to people, you know, instead of engaging directly with their physicians or having, you know, organizations that, that can be very open about this, this topic. Uh, it has to be sort of under the table. And so federal legalization could, could really help with that. Um, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. And uh, so, um, you know, just, just talking about some of these other sort of related issues, do you see, uh, do either of you guys see any connections between uh, reducing um, you know, uh, the likelihood of uh, suicide or overdose and treating the harms of toxic uh, exposure, uh, how that could be uh, treated with medical cannabis. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the substance use disorder <laughs> angle. Um, you know, I think first of all, many, many studies actually demonstrate that cannabis can help reduce opioid and alcohol and even tobacco use. Um, even prescription, right? Um, in the case of opioid use in the set, excuse me, in the setting of pain control, as just one example, cannabis creates this phenomenon called synergistic analgesia when used in combination with opioids. Again, not to demean opioids. Um, but what we see is that the amount of opioids needed to control pain to the degree that they might have been, uh, they might achieve alone is less. In other words, cannabis is opioid sparing. Um, with guidance, cannabis could be used to wean patients to lower doses of opioids or off of their opioids entirely while maintaining that good pain control they and their, you know, their, their care provider want to see. Um, this is really important to realize as cannabis does not, does not share the same risk profile of opioids causing, um, you know, cardiac or respiratory depression with overuse, misuse, or abuse. And unlike opioids too, Right, the risk of death from cannabis use or even cannabis withdrawal is no. Right, so head to head, we, we know which one is likely safer uh, for, for our, our, our people suffering from chronic pain. Um, we can and even should look at that methodology uh, in management when we're thinking about alcohol and tobacco cessation, right? Um, in addition to substance use, cannabis can be used to, to target the underlying causes of this dependence, right? We can't just treat the dependence or the misuse or the abuse, oftentimes there's an underlying cause for that, like PTSD, but also anxiety, depression, chronic pain, 
you know, other complex comorbidities that make cannabis very interesting and useful as a multifunctional therapy, right? With this one tool, we can address health and healing from, you know, multiple directions. And the fact of the matter also is that you know, patients are choosing cannabis to address these issues on their own with or without us, right? So imagine the degree of harm reduction will accomplish if clinicians, if the medical system, if the government at large supported them along the way too, which leads me to my last point on this. And that's that regulating cannabis by way of both quality control, right, creating safe products and access is yet again, a harm reduction tool in and of itself, right? It, it, it points our consumers through lawful pathways to verified, safe, tested, well-labeled and consistent quality cannabis that can be tracked and even recalled if necessary, right? There's a problem with the product supply. Mm -hmm. um, so those are safeguards uh, that do not exist in an unregulated market. Uh, so we have the opportunity right now to regulate this product for the benefit of our communities, right? Yes, salient point as a harm reduction tool. Great. Thank you, Dr. Knox. And uh, I really appreciate the points uh, that, that you and Eric made that this isn't about the demonization uh, of opioids. Uh, you know, the, we're not here in a contest about, you know, what's the best substance in the world. Uh, we're, we're here because we want to see patients have the best outcomes possible. It just so happens that uh, the therapeutic use of marijuana is integral in a lot of uh, inpatients achieving these outcomes a lot of the time. Uh, and unfortunately, federal policy right now is just, you know, uh, essentially a roadblock uh, to that. Uh, we're just about out of time. So uh, we're gonna let folks uh, leave with just uh, maybe a minute or two early. Really wanna thank uh, our guests, uh, Eric Gopel, uh, Dr. Rachel Knox and uh, Roz McCarthy. Roz had an emergency and had to drop off early. so. Um, uh, but, but we really appreciate everyone who's uh, participated in these uh, briefings. As I mentioned before, these briefings are available in archive form on YouTube. So feel free to reach out if you wanna check out any of the others on criminal justice reform, on social equity, on banking issues, uh, labor and drug testing. We really covered a wide variety of topics here. I really wanna thank our speakers. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, the Marijuana Justice Coalition is there to be a resource to uh, Senate offices as you're uh, learning more about this issue. Uh, please reach out. We're, we're happy to be a resource to you and uh, plug you in um, to, uh, to various communities who, have, uh, who are directly impacted by federal marijuana prohibition. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and have a great day.